Welcome everyone, in this video we are going to see what happens if one object is much heavier than the other one in an elastic collision. So, a couple of videos ago I derived two formulas for the velocities of two objects during an elastic collision. And those formulas, formulas were as follows and you can watch their derivations from the cards if you would like. Let me quickly write them. So we have 2m2 v2 divided by the sum of the masses. Here, this prime means the final velocity, the velocity after the collision. And if you don't see the prime, it means the initial velocity, so before the collision. And v2 final and v1 final formulas are symmetrical with each other, as I went over in my previous video. So I'm quickly copying that one as well. Great. So these are correct for any elastic collision. And elastic simply means that kinetic energy is conserved. Kinetic energy initial is equal to the kinetic energy final of the two block system. So what would happen if, let's say, M1 is much greater than M2? All right, so perhaps our picture is like this. We have M1 massive and we have M2 tiny. And they are moving in some direction and they will collide at some point. So what will happen? Can we make any simplifications in our formulas? Well, let's start with the velocity of our first object, the heavy object. So for our case, and I want to write with blue, v1 prime is going to be we will have the initial velocity here we have m1 minus m2 what i want to point out here is since m1 is much greater than m2 this difference well it is going to be just m1 if you subtract a very tiny number from a very big number you will get the big number the value will not change i mean it will of course change but it will be so little that you won't even notice. So for practical reasons, we can call this uh, this difference M1. Plus, we have 2M2V2 divided by M1 plus M2. Well, here again, we have M2 here. So since M2 is a tiny mass, it is close to zero, which means we can neglect this 2M2V2 term. So this goes to zero as well. And... On the denominator, we have M1 plus M2. I mean, this is approximately equal to M1. So we can neglect M2 here as well. As I said, I'm just making simplifications here. All right. This is this would not work if you have, let's say, a 100 kilogram object and a 1 kilogram object. It would require a lot more than that. Okay. I, I, imagine that there are tens of thousands of um, orders of magnitude between these. So M1 is much, much greater than M2. That's why we are able to make these simplifications. We are interested in the limit as we are interested in the behavior of these objects in the limit. All right. Think of it like that if you are not totally convinced. So this is the equation that we get. And we see that V1 prime is equal to V1. So the initial velocity of our a heavier object, much heavier object, is its final velocity as well. Which means that its velocity does not change. And it should make sense, I think, because let's say that you throw a uh, you throw a tennis ball to a train that is stopping. Can you accelerate the train? Can you even get it move an inch? No, you can't move it a centimeter, a millimeter. You can't move it at all. It won't move. So that is what it is telling us. The velocity of the heavier, the much heavier object will remain the same. What about the little guy? What will his velocity be? Well, V2 prime is, we have V2 and here we have M2 minus M1. Using same kind of reasoning, M2 is going to go to zero. So this, this what do you call this subtraction, this difference is negative M1. Plus, we have 2M1V1. This time, M1 stays there. It doesn't go anywhere. It is the big number, the big mass. Then we have M1 plus M2. 
this M2 goes to zero. So we can simplify by M1 to get that the final velocity of our lighter mass is negative V2 and let's see plus 2V1. All right. So using our train analogy, if we consider it the train case, the this term, the 2V1 term was, uh, it was zero because our train was stopping. So when I throw my ball to the train, it will come back with the same speed only in the different direction, the opposite direction. Or you can think of it as throwing a ball to a wall, for, 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 for example. It will, again, not be able to accelerate the wall because it has a much greater mass than our ball. But when it collides with the ball, when it collides with the wall, I, I mean, our ball will bounce back nearly with the same velocity and in the opposite direction. So this results really describe the reality. As I said, these only work in the case where we have a non-elastic collision. In real world, you can't really find elastic collisions. Only in the atomic scale, the collisions of particles, they are somewhat very, very closely elastic. But in real world, really none of the collisions are elastic. But in case of Newton's cradle, cradle and other cases, there are some collisions that come close to it. And this simple approach would describe those cases. So I hope you found this video helpful and enjoyed it. If you have any questions, please write them in the comment section. I hope to see you in another video. Until then, take care.